It's D-Day plus 12, 1944. A sudden channel storm whips the coast of Normandy. Off Omaha Beach lies the convoy carrying the 83rd. Ships break up and run aground. Ashore, the heavy steel landing piers are twisted and ripped apart. And for three days and three nights, the division rides out the storm, waiting. On D-Day plus 15, the storm subsides. Another three days and three nights pass before men and equipment of the 83rd Infantry Division finally get ashore and into their assembly area. Twenty-four hours later, the division moves up to relieve the 101st Airborne southwest of Carantan. They say Normandy is beautiful, but you couldn't prove it by me. I don't think any of our guys, or even the ones that came in before us, noticed it. And the civilians. All I remember is they seemed happy to see us, especially the kids. The one thing I remember about Normandy was the hedgerows, and they were the biggest damned hedges I ever saw. They were everywhere, around the fields, along the roads. Anywhere you turned, you bumped into one. We took over the positions of the 101st Airborne on the other side of Carantan, around the end of June. Then we attacked. I can remember the day it started. It was the 4th of July. Funny they picked that day. That's one 4th of July none of us will forget. Those hedgerows came in handy for holding ground. The only trouble was the Germans were using them too. I said those hedges were the biggest damned hedges I'd ever seen, and the toughest too. Worse than barbed wire. They were more like a stone wall, only worse. You could go over a stone wall, but you had to go through these hedges. Even our tanks had trouble doing that. We'd go through one, we'd move ahead about 50 yards or so, and there'd be another. It got us. We were fighting a couple of days for a piece of ground the size of a football field. We'd finally take it, move on a few yards, and then start all over again. All the time you had this feeling of being hemmed in. like being in a blind alley. You couldn't move. You couldn't see. Those German snipers could see all right. They were usually behind us. I don't know how many guys we lost in those hedgerows. It started raining. That ended our help from the air. That mud gave us almost as much trouble as the Germans. Our tanks and trucks were bogging down in the field. Those little country roads we had to use weren't much better. We were just beginning to get used to it. Then on July 25th, our planes began coming over. They came in waves. It looked like they were using every plane they had. The sky was filled with them. When they finished with the Germans, the going wasn't so tough. We started moving again and we didn't stop until we were in Brittany. It took us 23 days to get out of Normandy. That was 23 days and nights of steady fighting. It 
They gave us a few days rest and we started again. We were heading for St. Malo. In Normandy, it was the foot soldiers. They did most of the work. Now it was up to the artillery. The division's objective was St. Malo and Denard. Our job was to knock out the fortified lines that stood in its way. Chateauneuf was the first town. We took it and kept right on moving. Moving through Chateauneuf to fan out across the peninsula, we were already hitting the next fortified line. We flattened it and kept on moving. It took us three days to reach the outskirts of St. Malo. By that time, the Air Force was already pounding the citadel. We set up our guns and pitched in. The next day, our troops started moving into the city. We got into St. Malo all right, but that was only the beginning. There were still plenty of Germans in St. Malo, and they had orders to hold it. The town had to be cleared house by house, street by street. It took us almost a week. We were still fighting in the streets when elements of the division began moving on Denard on the other side of the estuary. Our patrols were already in the city. They cleared the way. Denard put us within striking distance of the citadel. Most of St. Malo was ours, but the citadel still held out. The old medieval fortress with its thick walls had resisted repeated aerial attacks and the constant shelling of our biggest guns. The situation called for desperate measures. We fired into the apertures of the fortress. That did it. With St. Malo and Denard out of the way, we began working on the island of Sazamre. Only our big guns could reach that heavily fortified little island. The Air Force joined in. General Macon himself went out to accept the surrender. Even before the fall of Sazamba, the division was on the move again. A battalion combat team was fighting its way west to help take the important port of Brest. The rest of the division headed inland. It was in the middle of August when we left Brittany and moved into the Loire Valley to protect the right flank of the Third Army. That gave us a line stretching along the Loire River from Nantes to Auxerre. That's quite a stretch, for a division anyway. In the signal company, we had about 800 miles of open wire to maintain. We had so many circuits, we had trouble keeping track of them. You see, the area the division had to watch reached from Brittany to the middle of France. That's close to 300 miles. The only way it could be covered was by splitting up into small patrols and scattering them all over hell. We had to see that they had communications. Maybe you think that's easy. We spent half our time trying to find them. Our motor messengers got a workout. They were making 80 mile runs two or three times a day. What we really needed for the job were L5s. We had a few, but we could have used a fleet of them. For the rest
rest of the guys in the outfit, the luar was a picnic. It was the first real rest they had since we left England, and they earned it. Funny thing about the luar, there was almost no action there, but the division made a record bag of prisoners. About 20,000 of them, all armed and fully equipped. And we took them without firing a shot. It took a lot of tricky negotiating, but they finally surrendered to Beaugency around the middle of September. They put on quite a show. The Germans weren't too unhappy about it. They were mostly service troops, and most of them were glad to be out of it. It was a job collecting their guns and equipment. The horses and wagons got me. You never saw so many. A few weeks after the surrender at Beaugency, the division got orders to move again. We moved east out of France and into Luxembourg. We finished clearing it and stayed there. A couple of months later, we headed toward Germany to relieve the 4th Infantry Division. It was around the beginning of December when the division moved into the Hurtgen. Most of our guys had never even heard of the place. I was with the engineers of the 83rd. We were moving slow. Guess we were kind of nervous. You couldn't see anything, but we'd heard stories. We didn't know what to expect. We found out soon enough. The whole forest was covered with mines and booby traps. It got so you were even afraid to move. It was just as bad as a hedgerow. Half the time you couldn't see what you were shooting at. It was different when you hit the open spots. You still had to fight, but at least you had a chance. But there weren't many of those in the hurricane. And then there was always the snow and cold. Most of the time we were crawling along, hoping and feeling our way. Even when the snow melted, we still had trouble. You never saw so much mud. We had to cover the roads with logs so that we could move our trucks and equipment. When we weren't ducking snipers, it seemed like we spent most of our time cutting down trees. We of the engineers used to say that we chopped our way through the Hurtgen. And we weren't kidding. If we weren't cutting down trees for roads, we were building shelters and CPs. When we first came into the Hurtgen, it was early December. The day before Christmas, we went after the last strong point between us and the river. We fought all day Christmas and then it was over. That night they loaded us into trucks and we began moving back into Belgium, fast. Someone said we were heading for the Ardennes. I was an operations officer. According to the books, it couldn't be done and the Germans certainly didn't think we could do it, but we did. 24 hours after leaving the Rohr, elements of the division were in the Ardennes and had made contact with the Germans. The rest of the division was right behind us. We met the enemy spearhead at Rochefort. Held. And finally pushed them back. In the Ardennes, we were fighting two battles, one against the Germans, the other against the weather. It's hard to say which was the worst. We had just as many casualties from the cold and snow. Certainly, it gave us more trouble. It stalled our armored units, disrupted supply and communications, and froze our weapons. There was little we could do to fight it. But in spite of the snow and cold, we kept after them. We kept after the enemy and we beat him. It had taken almost a month of steady fighting to do it. At the end of January, the division retired to an area north of Liège for re-equipping and training. 
A month later, the 83rd again received orders to attack. The objective was Neuss on the Rhine. I joined the 83rd in Belgium, along with a couple of thousand other replacements. Seemed like the whole outfit was made up of replacements. I guess there weren't too many of the old guys left. We met the Germans east of the Rohr, and from there on it was steady fighting until we reached the Rhine. Maybe it wasn't anything like the head goal, or the hurt goal, but it was plenty hot enough for me. I was sure glad when we got to Noyce. We were all set to cross the Rhine and keep going. We didn't have a chance. The Germans blew up the bridges in our faces. Instead, we pulled back into Holland. I guess it was around the end of March when we packed up and started for the Rhine again. We headed at Basel. This time, we crossed. After we crossed the Rhine, the general impression was that we were headed for Berlin. That was all right with us guys at Supply. We had plenty of stuff stockpiled in the rear. All we had to do was go back and get it. It would have been a cinch, too, if the division had moved along the way we expected. But they didn't. Instead of following the second armored and cleaning up, as we were supposed to, we were ordered to strike out on our own. It wasn't so bad at first. We'd bring up a load of supplies, pick up a load of prisoners, and go back. But when they started rolling, that's when we had trouble keeping up with them. We had to do two miles for every mile they gained, one up and one back. They crossed the basin. They were really tearing along. The Germans were breaking up and it was becoming a chase instead of a fight. By now, the division was using anything that moved to carry troops. That's when everyone began calling us the ragtag circus. We looked it. Half the time, we were alongside or ahead of the second armor, and it got to be a race. We were making supply runs of 200 miles and better. By the time the 83rd reached the Elbe, it had covered something like 200 miles in less than 10 days. We crossed the Elbe in assault boats and set up a bridgehead on the other side. While we were fighting to hold it, our engineers got a bridge across. Reinforcements began coming. Even pushed ahead. We got as far as Zerps. Then they told us to stop. And we stopped. It was tough. Berlin was only 40 miles away. It took a year to come over 2,500 miles across Europe. We could have gone on, but the 83rd had done its job. Four days later, the European war ended. 